Plato's Euthyphro. Let's just jump on in. Which do you think exhibits the best way of thinking? The story is told by Plato in such a way that he hopes to attract people to Socrates' way of thinking, so it's not surprising that most of you um, like Socrates' way of thinking. One of the tasks you face when you read a Platonic dialogue is to flesh out the characters. You know what I mean by flesh out? So what does Euthyphro do in his society, and, um, and how does he fit into it? He's a soothsayer and general religious expert. Whenever I speak of divine matters in the assembly, this is like Congress or something, and foretell the future, people laugh me down as if I were crazy. He acts boldly and takes specific actions on the basis of his beliefs, like what? He prosecutes his own father. Do you notice how he reasons about these things? The pollution is the same if you knowingly keep company with such a man and do not cleanse yourself and him by, by bringing him to justice. Justice is a way of washing off moral stain. You see, he, you, you begin to see that this guy really is operating at a religious level. There are stories about the gods that explain that you do take justice even on somebody in your own family, even your father, right? They swallow their, their children, they, they castrate their dead, there's war, there's hostility, um, there are fights among the gods, and so those things can be good among people, and he's, he's just imitating the gods. Socrates and Euthyphro seem to regard one another as kindred spirits. I mean, oh, whoa! <laughs> That'll never happen again. I want to challenge you to think through that. Um, you know, what their attitude to one another is. Here's something I'd point out about their kind of limited kinship. Uh, Euthyphro says, well, Melitus slanders and misrepresents you, Socrates, because of your belief in the divine. The same is true in my case. They're on the outs with their society. They're both weirdos. Well, Socrates says, to be laughed at doesn't matter, perhaps, for the Athenians don't mind anyone they think clever as long as he doesn't teach his own wisdom. But if they think that he was making others like himself, they get angry, which is a nice way of saying, well, maybe they laugh at you, but they take me seriously. <laughs> they don't laugh at my ideas. I'm, a, I'm actually pretty persuasive. Uh, another thing that they have in common is both of them are regarded as guilty of asebea. Asebea is impiety, failure to have respect for what you ought to have respect for. What is Euthyphro's impiety? Prosecuting his dad. Prosecuting his dad. And Socrates' impiety? Skepticism. About the traditional gods and instead his determination to redefine uh, what, what he respects as God. So they're both, they both challenge the status quo. Now, let's flesh Socrates out a little bit. What does Socrates do and how is he regarded? He challenges the traditional assumptions about the gods and instead his loyalty is, is towards a different kind of god than his culture had generally encouraged, right? And he's regarded, well, not so much as an object of ridicule, but as someone who is a serious danger to the society. How about his level of certainty? Euthyphro is absolutely sure of his answers, and Socrates? No, he's saying, I'm never sure about this stuff. Thank goodness you understand, because now you can teach me. When uh, Euthyphro tells the story, these stories about Uranos, Kronos, and Zeus, Socrates says, I find it hard to accept things like that being said about the gods. And do you believe there really is war among the gods? Now, Socrates has a hard time with that. If the gods torture one another and hate one another and, and don't get along and have wars, what makes them gods? Who cares about the gods if they're not good? Socrates is less, less interested in God and the divine than Euthyphro is. By my argument, he's not. <laughs> they define the divine in different ways, but what Socrates calls God, he's willing to die for. Tohosion, the holy, as I will translate it, that's something that's sacred. It's the thing out there that a human looks at and says, wow, that is worthy of respect. Uh, we might call it sublime. Dosevas, that's piety. It's the experience, the human experience of 
Wow. So this is the thing that's seen. This is the human experience of it, the object response. So the yeah but here again is you ought to show resp respect to what deserves respect, right? And so he says, but, so okay, I get it. There are things we should show respect to. And what are the kinds of things that, ins that should inspire that awe? And Euthyphro says, well, it's what's dear to the gods. The problem there, of course, is that lots of things are dear to the gods, and it turns out that even the gods seem to be confused about what's good. So Euthyphro says, oh, 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 yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, then what's dear to all of them? But the problem with that is that, that there are two ways of interpreting the, you know, the notion of what's dear to all the gods. Um, is it that what's dear to all the gods because they have a vote, and suddenly that makes that pious? The arbitrariness of everybody agreeing on something that, uh, that can't be what we mean when we say that something is worthy of our awe. Or, the alternate view of if all the gods love it is, it, is it because then there's something about that thing that they should love and they'd be wrong, they couldn't be gods if they didn't love it? Now do you see what, a pro what problem has arisen for Euthyphro? There's something of more fundamental importance logically prior to the gods. The gods as characters find themselves necessarily respectful to something that is just because it's good. Socrates' intuition is that all these various, these different virtues that people pull up as yeah buts to distract when, when a person's trying to figure out one thing, he ends, he's going to end up saying, you know what, ultimately they've all got to be something like the same thing. All good things are good because, well, they're good. Socrates, he keeps asking him what service the gods want from people. The gods want to make things better. They want people to make things better. And the way to, fig to, to become the kind of people you should be is figure out what's good, right? <laughs> Try to understand the good, and then you can be good. And the gods can't want anything more than that. And, and in a way, the gods themselves become, they become kind of extraneous because the good is the God. It's the ultimate top dog in the universe there, right? Um, I want us to, uh, to break up into our groups now, and I want you to kind of just get into this Euthyphro character and Socrates character and try to figure out how to think of some ways to translate that into, uh, into modern, modern circumstances. I like the way Socrates kind of says, all right, well, all right, I'll take exactly what you're saying and break it down to you so that you begin to even question what you're thinking. Well, I think that I think that people said Socrates just because they thought that was the right thing to say, whereas I think everyone really identified the Athenian people more. Like, who really thinks like that? None of us just walk around, like, questioning people all the time. It's good for who he is, but if everyone was doing that all the time, the world would be on the I, I agree with you that I don't think everybody thinks the way Socrates speaks, yeah. but I don't think that Socrates thinks the way Socrates speaks all the time, every day. I don't think, you know, when somebody makes him toast in the morning, he says, well, you know, what, how do you philosophically view this toast? Am I eating it or am I eating the thought that you had? You know, I don't think that happens. While we don't go around questioning everybody we meet, it wouldn't necessarily be a bad thing if we did, and I definitely don't think that, you know, a world with more questioning and more of Socrates' frame of thought would be a place where people would want to, you know, jump off bridges and cry. Yeah. If we were in a constant, always being questioned on what we think and stuff, I mean, it'd just be a little bit nuts. Sometimes you got to take things at face value and not question everything. Like you said, I can question if toast is toast or toast is bread or... I think if we start doing that, but like if we if we all just decide to do that, though, like eventually we'd get the answers we wanted. We wouldn't all come to the same conclusions. I mean, that just seems to be so unenjoyable that there wouldn't be a reason to there wouldn't be a reason to wake up in the morning. What if we just relegated it to the big fanciful questions that no one can pin down an answer like Socrates What's is What's the doing? purpose of life? Yeah, good, right, justice, all these big words that we all seem to have problems with. What if everyone adopted a more Socratic method in trying to deal with those issues as opposed to, hey, I really like the way you tie your shoes, so let's talk about that. It deserves more respect than coming up to people on the street and just asking them. There'd need to be some sort of, like this. It was a different time back then, whereas I think, I agree with what you're saying, now we'd have to have a more formal setting. Kind of like a presidential debate or something like that. 
or this. We also live in an age where it's a lot more possible to have a larger forum of people than it ever, it certainly was in ancient Greece, and really than it ever has been, you know. You can sign online and talk to people in Timbuktu. Yeah. And so I don't think it's a question of having enough places to do it, because if we're looking for forum space, we've got more than enough. I think it's more a question of getting people to be willing to enter that kind of dialogue, and I think it's less the idea of, you know, everything being broken down and more the idea of being challenged that people step back from.